Welcome to this UKLFI webinar on international law, propaganda and diplomacy. It is a great pleasure to have with us from the United States, Richard D. Heidemann, Washington-based attorney and senior counsel of Heidemann, Nudelman and Kalik. He has represented American victims of terrorism and claims against Libya, Syria, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the PLO, and other organizations and financial institutions accused of providing material support for terrorism, obtaining judgments in the hundreds of millions on behalf of victims and their families. He's been involved in Holocaust era assets litigation and has submitted amicus filings in support of Israel and the Jewish people at the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal and the United States Supreme Court. He also has a long history mm -hmm. in communal leadership, including as the president of the American Zionist movement. And his latest book, The Bloody Price of Freedom, is due out on the 10th of October. Now, I've been fortunate to read some extracts and I have to say, Richard, your ability to articulate so clearly issues that are intuitive to those of us steeped in the world of anti-Israel related propaganda and international law, but your ability to articulate those matters so clearly to a wider audience is enviable. And I look forward to the rest of the book when it comes out in a couple of months time. And we are tremendously grateful that you have taken the time to share with us your experience of the interrelationship between propaganda maligning Israel diplomatic assaults on Israel and the misapplication of international law, and to take us through some of the important background and historical developments. Now, I encourage our audience to please put their questions in the Q&A facility on your screens so that I can put those to our speaker after his opening remarks. Richard, the floor is yours. Well, Natasha, thank you very much. It's good to see you again and to have this opportunity to again uh, work together. And I want to take this um, moment to pay tribute to uh, UK Lawyers uh, for Israel, uh, to, uh, to Caroline and to Jonathan uh, Turner for their tremendous dedication, but also for their vision, their foresight and their leadership. They have been fearless in advancing issues that need to be addressed and following the rule that silence is no option. And Natasha, you are so noted and acclaimed for your work in international law, not only in the UK, but around the world. And we thank you for the important contribution that you have been making, are making, and we know will continue to make uh, to this effort, all of us need to be engaged in in order to work together uh, to make a difference. Because I repeat, silence is not an option. Uh, we've prepared an agenda and a short PowerPoint uh, for the first part of this program. I've asked uh, a member of our law firm, Joseph H. Tippograph, uh, to join us and share his screen with us so that we can rapidly walk through issues regarding uh, international law, propaganda, and diplomacy with a focus on the perpetuation of hate. And uh, for you to understand that, uh, at least in our view, all of these issues converge together. There is a convergence and there's a confluence approach that we think is necessary to take, which I'll address as we move forward. Uh, you'll see that we've listed three bullet points uh, as our agenda. Uh, it's uh, Nuremberg. I'm going to put things in 100 years of context, uh, uh, legalizing hate, prosecuting genocide, hijacking international law and diplomacy that uh, continues to this very moment, and both the propaganda that's used and the perpetuation of hate that is the mantra of those who choose to demonize not just Israel, but the Jewish people. Let's uh, get started together. You know, I said I was going to go back a hundred years. It was in 1920 that the uh, um, Nazi 25 point manifesto was rolled out by Adolf Hitler. And it envisioned then a Nazi party that will fight Jewish interests 
a Nazi party that will uh, consider crimes against the common interest of all Germans to be punished with death, and clearly stating that only Germans may be citizens of Germany. Only those of the German races may be members of the nation. Their religion does not matter, and specifically saying no Jew may be a citizen. We hear those cries today. Together, we need to stand up against those cries. Take a look, though, at what began in the 30s with the establishment, next slide, of the Nuremberg Laws, because uh, we're just 90 so approximately 90 years uh, since the uh, Nuremberg Laws were enacted as laws of the state, a government enforcing citizenship laws that only German or kindred blood people could be citizens, and a decree that defined non-citizens uh, as Jews by birth or blood and law for the protection of German blood and German honor, which banned marriage and relations between Jews and Germans. You know these issues, being in the UK, being in Europe, being internationalists, but it never hurts us to be reminded. And in fact, I believe it's essential to be reminded of history. And I'm not going back thousands of years, I'm only going back less than 100 years. And the, 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 the relationship between what happened then and what we're encountering today uh, is eerily more than concerting. It's dangerous. You will see that in 1933, the Third Reich initiated the initial Jewish boycott with stormtroopers raiding Jewish-owned stores in Germany to segregate Jews from Germans, dragging Jewish workers into the streets, humiliating and degrading them, alongside Germans who employed or engaged socially with Jews. What have we seen just in the last 12 months in Europe, across the United States, around the world, Jews being dragged, Jews being assaulted, and the boycott is being used as if it is not just a civil uprising or a, a civil contempt, but rather is a mantra that gives people authorization to attack. You will see that the contemporary comparisons from back in 1933 to today are are grossly related. In April 1st, 1933, there was a day-long nationwide Jewish business boycott and supported by the government, supported by the Gestapo, and, uh, and putting the words Jude or a large star of David on stores. Is it different than the labeling that we're seeing today? Although the labeling is deemed to be under law, but then it was under law, and Jewish workers were fired then. Laws targeting Jewish lawyers and doctors were enacted. And we are seeing today Jews being told today in the news, Jews have too much power. Jews have too much voice. Jews have too much control. Jews be quiet. Next slide, please. Lawyers were a key tool of the Nuremberg era, the Nazi era. German law professors were conscripted, conscripted to defend discriminatory laws, and the court system became a Nazi propaganda tool. Laws were enacted, laws were enforced, and by 1985, 1945, over 80% of all serving German judges prosecutors, and legal bureaucrats were Nazi party members. You see people today who are in high positions, including members of the United States Congress, attacking Jews, attacking Israel, attacking Zionists, attacking all of us in not just the verbal sense, but calling for us to be ostracized. And the impact of the role of lawyers 
being diminished inhibited Jewish people's ability to thrive economically, socially, religiously, or humanly. And it rendered the Jewish people enemies of the state. And of course, we could do how many lectures, how many presentations on the Shoah? Only one slide paints a picture. The train tracks into Birkenau at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Young children as victims and behind barbed wire. And what was called deportations showing a map. Whereas you know, not only 6 million Jews and countless others, not only a million plus children, but in Auschwitz, Birkenau alone, along with Belzec, Chelmno, Sobibor, and Treblinka, nearly 2.7 million people, primarily Jews, were murdered. And today, evidence has been gathered because that evidence was kept by the Nazis. And that evidence was deposited at Bad Erlsen in Germany. And after the war, that evidence was put under the authority of 11 governments and then given to the International Red Cross. And at the International Red Cross, they kept all those records. And only today are those records really being fully digitized. And we now know about 100 million documents. We now know about between 11 and 17 million victims, not just six victims. Justice is not perfect. And at Nuremberg, <clears throat> the same place as the Nuremberg laws were enacted, <clears throat> the Nuremberg trials were held. And as some of you may know, Alan Dershowitz, Erwin Kotler and I chaired a program just a few years ago under the auspices of the March of the Living, which my wife Phyllis uh, serves as president of. And we brought together speakers from around the world, justices from Rwanda, justices from Canada, justices from all over, to focus in and help to teach the lessons of the Nuremberg Laws and the Nuremberg Trials. These materials are available online. We'll provide you with the link. And the Nuremberg trials were headed by Justice Robert Jackson and Lord Justice Sir Jeffrey Lawrence. And they saw three options for justice for the Nazi regime. Let the atrocities go unpunished, execute or otherwise punish the perpetrators without a hearing, or determine the innocence or guilt of the accused after a hearing. And that's what was done, not perfect, but with witnesses being brought forth and physical evidence being brought forth. And the prosecutors submitted thousands of documents and photos and videos. As a result, there were convictions. Too few, too many got away, imperfect justice, but the beginning of international law as we know it, the initiation and in, uh, of the word genocide by Raphael Lemkin, the work on the, that developed into the United Nations Genocide Convention, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Geneva Convention on the Laws and Customs of War. These byproducts serve as seminal documents for modern international law, which continues to be imperfect justice. Next, please. As we move to the hijacking of international law and diplomacy. Um, next slide, please. One has to ask the question, was Nazi Germany replaced by the Arab League? Because in 1944, Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon signed the Alexandria Protocol. It led to the formation of the Arab League and the Zionist Israel boycott. And since 1944, up until just a year ago with the Abraham Accords, no member of the Arab League except for Jordan and except for Egypt 
had any relations with Israel. It has been more than a cold peace. It has been nasty. And it has been led by the Arab League, which not only controls the governments of the Arab League, because they all participate, but they also have a powerful standing at the United Nations. And next slide, they adopted a multifaceted warfare against Israel. You will see again the Alexandria Pro uh, Protocol. You will see that it adopted in 1945 the Zionist boycott. In 1948, the five countries attacking Israel after it announced its declaration in May. Uh, 1956, another war. 1967, another war. 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Next slide, please. And then in 1975, after all those wars were lost, the Arab League pressed its bias at the United Nations by shifting from warfare on the ground to warfare in the diplomatic sphere, adopting the Zionism equals racism resolution at the United Nations. And what happens when you call somebody a racist? It's the worst thing you can call them. When you equate Zionism with racism, you are indeed equating the worst with the worst. And that has been implanted. And only at the Nairobi Conference of the United Nations in 1985 was there a break in the Zionism racism resolution because when a number of us went to Nairobi. My wife, Phyllis, was a delegate. The UN conference to assess and appraise the status of women turned into a tremendous anti-Semitic activity on the grounds of the United Nations in Nairobi, at the forum, and in the official UN conference. And in 2001, just two weeks before 9-11, the attacks on the United States, there was held the Durban conference. I served at that time as president of B'nai B'rith International and as a chair of the uh, United Nations Committee for the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. And in those capacities served as the head of delegation for the, for the Jewish organizations. It was a hate fest 20 years ago this month. We walked out of that conference and we walked out with dignity. Lord Janner and I, arm in arm, walked out and led the walkout, along with the ambassadors from the United States and from Israel. But the seeds of hate planted at Durban in the Durban program, those seeds of hate govern today. Those seeds of hate were planted by terror organizations, they were planted by civil society and NGO organizations, and they follow a program that even today is followed and embraced at the United Nations. There was in 2009, a Durban Review Conference that reinforced the Durban program. There was, uh, in, there will be next month in 2021 at the United Nations, a Durban Four and many governments, thank God, have said we are not going to go to this conference. The United States, Canada, I believe now the UK, Australia, Germany. Others hopefully will similarly not participate in not dignify the Durban program. But there has been money allocated by the United Nations to advance the Durban program and to hold this Durban for. There was a small breakthrough at the United Nations. Last year, the UN Special Rapporteur on Religious Freedom made, gave a speech where he clearly said that parts of the United Nations are indeed anti-Semitic. You know that, we know that, but for somebody from the United Nations to say it was tremendous. Let's look at what Israel has encountered at the United Nations. Uh, next slide. In 1950 to 1975, 83 new countries were admitted, including 14 Arab League members. There were only four anti-Israel resolutions per year prior to the 1973 war. But if you recall, I indicated to you that after that war, the diplomatic warfare dramatically increased. And from 1973 to 1978, there were 16 anti-Israel resolutions per year. 
The uh, Zionism Racism Resolution was sponsored in 1975 by 22 Arab League states. In 1982, there were 44 anti-Israel resolutions. And just last year, there were 22 anti-Israel resolutions. More resolutions about Israel, attacking Israel, maligning Israel than all the other nations put together in the world. There have been voting trends that we've tracked uh, at the United Nations. Let me just give you two. Um, the Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People and the Division for Palestinian Rights of the Secretariat. These are committees and a division that are funded at the United Nations, funded in order to teach hate against Israel, funded under the guise that they are protecting Palestinian rights. Don't misunderstand me. Palestinians have rights and Palestinians deserve those rights to be protected. But Israel has been suffered the most serious damage as amb former Ambassador Shifter, now gone, said uh, then that each of these resolutions funds a program that would literally end the existence uh, of Israel. And before we change slides, I wanna point something out. You will see in the last few years from 19, from, from 2000, 17 to 2020, a diminishment of votes against Israel. I want to share with you. Later, I'll talk a little more about diplomacy as a tool we should all follow in utilizing our international legal skills to stand up and be counted for all Jewish people, for Israel. As president of the American Zionist Movement, working with my wife as president of the March of the Living, working with Israeli Ambassador Danny Danone at the United Nations, and now Israeli Ambassador Gilad Erdan at the United Nations, we have taken in the last four years more than 100 Israeli ambassadors, first to Poland for Holocaust education, taking them into the concentration camps, taking them into Maidanek, where we closed the door and they looked up at those gas heads of the showers, taking them in to see the incinerators, and then taking them onto Israel for meetings, for participation, for engagement, to go into the tunnels of Hezbollah, to go into the tunnels of Hamas to see the burned out forests and to meet with people on all sides of the conflict. The voting trends have improved at the United Nations. And some of the countries that voted against Israel are either abstaining or they're not showing up for their votes. And these are people who actually have been to Poland and Israel with us. But all of this has to be viewed in the context of terror. We've suffered in Israel, the intifada, next slide please, uh, uh, um, of the first intifada in 1987 with the encouragement of the Arab League. The second intifada from 2000 to 2005 carried out by Hamas and others with the support of Iran, Syria, the PA and PLO and others. Suicide bombings, kidnappings, shootings, stabbings, a thousand Israelis killed, 3,000 Palestinians killed. And those acts of terror have largely been able to be stopped by the construction of Israel's terrorism prevention security fence, fencing out the terrorists. Israel's accused of having built the apartheid wall, which we'll talk about in a moment because they were taken in 2003 to the International Court of Justice, which rendered an opinion in 2004. But I want to jump forward to the period since 2005, the era of what we call the electronic intifada, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, reaching young people, reaching people around the world, and turning the tide of hatred deeper and deeper against Israel and the Jewish people. We now have evidence that it's designated foreign terror organizations, 
that are the manipulators behind the boycott campaign. They not only sponsor terror, they sponsor hate. Let's look at what happened at the International Court of Justice. In 2003, while the Israeli courts were dealing with issues of whether or not the construction of the wall, which is only approximately 4% a concrete barrier, whether or not the construction of that wall was a violation of international law. And although the UN Security Council was seized of the issue of peace between Israel and the Palestinians, the quartet was involved. Governments were involved. Both Israel and the Palestinians were involved. Nevertheless, the Palestinians went directly to the General Assembly and they asked for the adoption of, and it was adopted, a resolution referring to the International Court of Justice on what are the legal consequences arising from the construction of the wall being built by Israel and referring to Israel as the occupying power in the occupied Palestinian territory, including in and around East Jerusalem, as described in the report of the Secretary General considering the rules and principles of international law, including the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949 and relevant Security Council and General Assembly resolutions. In that 2003 referral to the International Court of Justice, it was a referral from the General Assembly seeking an advisory opinion. Now, I don't know about in the UK to tell you the truth, but in the United States, our courts don't give advisory opinions. Maybe attorney generals will give opinions. Maybe prosecutors will give an opinion. Maybe political officials will give opinions. But courts do not give, at least in the United States, advisory opinions. And as a matter of definition, an advisory opinion coming from the UN's court, the International Court of Justice, is to be just that, an advisory opinion. But unfortunately, international law has been hijacked. On July 9th, 2004, the International Court of Justice rendered its advisory opinion saying that Israel violated international law, that the barrier severely impedes Palestinian self-determination. Israel must stop construction, dismantle and nullify related laws. And the UN should consider further action to end the illegal situation. What we've seen then, what we've seen since in almost uh, in, in, in 18 years since the opinion, what we've seen is really a hijacking of international law because A, jurisdiction was wrongly accepted, B, self-defense of Israel was ignored, and evidence that was considered only dealt with UN resolutions and evidence from the Palestinians but not evidence of the terror on the ground that was the necessity for building that terror prevention security fence. And since the issuance of this opinion, courts around the world, politicians around the world, newscasters around the world, cite to the advisory opinion as authority that Israel is in violation of international law. And the fact of the matter is, it is truly a miscarriage of justice. It is truly a hijacking. And all the other conflicts in the world are ignored, essentially, except for this one. And let's go one step further, because there's also the court at the, uh, another court at The Hague that's a UN court called the International Criminal Court. And as you know, because many of you have participated and UK Lawyers for Israel has participated, filed briefs, and many of us worked together because there was an announcement by the ICC prosecutor of a preliminary examination as it relates to Israel's alleged war crimes, almost ignoring the conduct of Hamas, the conduct of terrorists, uh, the foundation which uh, uh, our daughter, uh, Ilana, Dr. Ilana Heidemann heads the Israel Forever Foundation, uh, filed and our law firm signed a brief uh, with the International Court of Justice, making it clear that the Palestinian Authority is not a state party. Israel is not a party to the Rome Statute. The PA lacks jurisdiction and the ability to delegate this dispute to the International Criminal Court. 
and that the referral was sought with unclean hands. Nevertheless, the pretrial chamber earlier this year determined it has jurisdiction and the prosecutor who's just changed is announced before she left office, the investigation commencement. Very dangerous. Let's move further from the hijacking of international law to the use of propaganda and the perpetuation of hate. Issues that are used include an improper definition of refugees. All refugees in the world are resettled within countries to which they have been settled, except for Palestinian refugees pursuant to UNRWA. There, the head count is not just of those who were displaced, which today would be about 200,000 people, but under UNRWA, the head count is 5.2 million people because it includes all of those who were born after the displacement of the grandparents. In the playbook of the perpetuation of hate is the use of victimhood. Victimhood because victimhood requires a perpetrator and Israel and the Jewish people are painted as perpetrators. And although the resolution was vacated by the United Nations, Zionism racism is alive. Israel is referred to as an apartheid state. And let me ask you, when you accuse anybody, any country of being apartheid, a segregationist, being racist, being a hater, being a criminal, being an apartheid racist criminal state, it's about the worst thing you can do to any country. And analogies to, the, to South Africa's apartheid do not belong. You all have been there. We have to tell the story and show the pictures of people from all walks of life, all religions in their garb, all races, walking and enjoying the liberties and the streets and the freedom of the religion in the holy places and for access to all people in Israel. There has been this tremendous effort of alienation, and it's rolling out today with gross anti-Semitism, anti-Israelism, and a denial and distortion of the Holocaust as another use. But they use even pictures. Look at this next slide on propaganda from Palestinian Media Watch. They show our friend Prime Minister Netanyahu in Nazi garb because Israelis and Jews are regularly accused of being the Nazis of today when in fact we are the Jews of today who have been hated, who have been murdered. And we have to use our legal skills, all of us, to work together to stand against this propaganda and the perpetuation of hate. We have to have, as the next slide shows, zero tolerance for anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti as well as Holocaust denial. Look at the last slide. Israel has no history, only a criminal record. Every tool is being used to paint Israel as this apartheid racist criminal state. And I urge you as lawyers, as we do in our own law firm, to follow as indicated in the next slide, the confluence approach, utilizing the essential tools of the courts, the court of public opinion and diplomacy working to hold state and non-state sponsors of terror legally accountable, utilizing tools that we know how to use, litigation, legislation, and diplomacy. Take a look at the next slide, because what we have done working with other law firms around the world is seeking to hold sponsors of terror legally accountable, launching lawsuits against Libya, the UN was against Libya. The US was against Libya. Gaddafi paid $1.5 billion to American victims of Libyan terrorism to get off the US State Department list of state sponsors of terror. The Syrian Arab Republic sponsors uh, 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 Hamas. It sponsors Hezbollah. Various US courts and other courts have found Syria to be liable 
And in one particular case in which our firm is involved regarding a hijacking, the US courts found Syria to be liable for the hijacking, gave us a federal court judgment for the, cert, for, for the Lloyds of London underwriters who, who insured the airplane, an Egypt Air flight in which our American clients were killed or injured. And as a result of getting that judgment in the United States, our team took it to the UK courts and the UK courts have recognized the US judgment and have taken steps, some of which is under seal, so I can't comment further, but it is pending today in the UK courts. Cases against the Islamic Republic of Iran, between 50 and $100 billion of judgments have been entered against Iran. Cases are ongoing in the United States. Canada adopted justice for victims of terror legislation. And a lawyer that I spoke to just last week from B'nai B'rith Canada told me they've collected $30 million of Iranian assets uh, in, in, uh, in Canada for the benefit of the victims. And enforcement efforts are underway in Italy and the courts ruled there not to give full faith and credit to the US judgments, but different countries are taking different approaches and law teams are working hard to take the judgments domesticate them and seek to enforce them. We have a case going on against the PLO and the Palestinian Authority since 2003, 18 years. It's been all the way up to the Supreme Court and is now back. And one of the tools that we use to get it back from the Supreme Court to the trial court is we asked Congress to adopt legislation that says that if the Palestinian Authority accepts aid from the United States, and if it has an office in the United States, and if it pays terrorists and their families, it subjects itself to the US court jurisdiction, and that case is being litigated now. The case against the Arab Bank, as you may have read, was litigated and went to a jury trial in federal court in New York, and the Arab Bank was found guilty, and victims of the Second Intifada who were victims of Hamas were able to recover. It resulted in a settlement that's confidential. I can't comment on it. And new litigation is ongoing, multi-jurisdictional litigation against the Qataris in the UK, in the Netherlands, in the United States. Next slide, please. We try to also use diplomacy. I wrote to Secretary of State Anthony Blinken when he first came in as the new Secretary of State. And I asked him, stand against anti-Semitism, stand against Holocaust denial. And he wrote me back saying that he and the Biden administration are committed to Israel's security and to strengthening all aspects of the US-Israel partnership, Holocaust remembrance and countering anti-Semitism at home and around the world. And then he said, and the Biden administration enthusiastically embraces the 2016 IRA definition of anti-Semitism, including its examples. As you already know, and I, this is not promotional, it's just to tell you, I wrote a book called The Hague Odyssey in 2013. It's about Israel's struggle for security on the front lines of terror and her battle for justice at the UN. And as uh, Natasha said, uh, my new book, we just got our hard copies pre-publication, The Bloody Price of Freedom, takes us all the way current, all the way through the Abraham Accords. We believe in this confluence approach, utilizing our skills and your skills and our commitment and your commitment to stand against terror, to seek to hold sponsors of terror legally accountable, to seek those who are hateful to be exposed, to see to it that we stand up for the victims and we stand up loudly, clearly, and strongly in the court of public opinion, in the courts, and go to our legislators, the presidents, the foreign ministers, the diplomats, the UN ambassadors, the secretaries of state, and individual members of Congress, because I close with this, at least in the United States, every victim, has one member of Congress from their district and two senators from their state. So when we have trouble with the law, 
We're not afraid to go to members of Congress on behalf of their constituents and say, we need a legislative fix. Fix the law because the courts aren't upholding the law and because the violators are ignoring the law. And I close with this. One judge had given up on entering judgments against Iran because he said Iran wasn't listening. And he asked me to argue the issue in front of him. And I was privileged to do so. And I argued, Your Honor, you're the only one who can make them listen. The President of the United States can't. The Congress can't. The press can't. The NGOs can't. And I argued, when you assess damages, award punishment or punitive damages. Set an example. Add as many zeros as you can. And when he signed his judgment, he granted a $1 billion punitive damages judgment against the Islamic Republic of Iran. We hope and pray that someday there will be no terror, but we know that we have to stand against terror. You as lawyers, we as lawyers, we can make a difference. Thank you very much. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Um, there is a great deal to contend with. Uh, and after that background in the development uh, in international di diplomatic assaults uh, on Israel, perhaps I can start, questions have already started to come in, but perhaps I can start by asking Richard, um, how do you see this playing out uh, in international law? As law students, we learned that law properly so-called must be universally applied. It cannot be arbitrarily or unequally applied if it is to be respected and followed. So how do we grapple uh, with those principles in light of, for example, the wall opinion that you've described? So I've advocated a zero tolerance, a zero tolerance policy with regard to anti-Semitism. What I'm about to say is gonna sound absurd, but I think we lawyers around the world need to adopt a zero tolerance policy as it relates to the court system. We need to bring more cases. I know it takes resources, it takes funding, it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of sleepless nights, but by working together, because none of us are alone, how many hundreds are here? How many thousands are in the International Legal Forum that was founded by Yifa Siegel in Jerusalem? How many of us are involved in our own organizations with other lawyers? Talk to lawyers. And it doesn't matter their religion or their race or their views. Talk to them and get them to engage with you, utilizing principles of international law to challenge. Go to the European Court on Human Rights. Go to your courts in the UK. Join us as amici wherever you can in appropriate cases. We have one case up at the Supreme Court now, and amicus briefs are being filed by organizations and by law firms and even by members of Congress. Those things happen only if we work hard together to make them happen. So, Natasha, on the issue of international law, we need to challenge the misuse of international law, the hijacking of international law, and not be afraid to say to a court, excuse me, your honor, but this statement is wrong and here's why, and then get others to join, other law firms, competitor law firms, bold law firms, but all it takes is one solicitor, one barrister to speak up, to file something, to make a difference, to write an op-ed, and to gather support. I hope that's helpful. Well, perhaps we can start that process right now uh, with an answer to uh, one of the questions from the audience. Uh, our viewer asks, much of the world regards the United Nations as a lawmaking quasi-parliament. Therefore, when the UN says that Judea and Samaria belongs to the Palestinians, too many people regard this UN position as international law. What do you consider the most powerful response beyond using the Balfour Declaration and San Remo Declaration? Everybody has to remember that the General Assembly is made up of one nation, one vote. 
It's controlled by the Arab League and the movement that has a majority, and Israel is going to lose in those votes. But that's not the force of law. It's a resolution of the General Assembly, which doesn't make law. The Security Council comes closer with Security Council resolutions. And we have to see to it that countries like the UK and countries like France and countries like the United States stand up against every attempt possible to improperly adopt a resolution. The United States has been a stalwart. President Obama on his way out of office didn't veto a particular resolution. That is heralded as a victory. And it has been maligned by many, applauded by many, but it still didn't make law. And the International Court of Justice doesn't make law except when it decides a case between two parties that are, have, have acceded to the Rome Statute. And therefore, there is this basic misunderstanding that when they say something, it constitutes international law, and it doesn't. It takes bold lawyers to be willing to stand up, speak up, and to write, 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 and I'll repeat, not only in the courts, but in the court of public opinion. Absolutely right. And, and there's a follow up question here. Um, how binding is a UN resolution against Israel? Uh, how much trouble does Israel really suffer from, uh, except for negative imagery? And I think it's so important to stress what you've just said, uh, because, of course, these UN resolutions, be they General Assembly or Security Council resolutions, when we look at the history of resolutions passed against Israel, uh, are political rather than legal instruments. They don't have binding force. There hasn't been a resolution uh, from the Security Council made with respect to Israel under uh, Chapter 7 binding rubric. Uh, and there's a great misconception uh, that when the UN speaks, uh, that has a, an immediate binding impact. Um, in particular, with respect to Israel, uh, that, that clearly doesn't, uh, doesn't present itself. Um, Richard, sticking with the UN just for a moment, uh, there's another question that's been posed to do with the UN Committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of Can the Palestinians. Can I interrupt you, Natasha? Yes, yeah, of course. Go back to the last one with your permission. By all means. You know, uh, the United Kingdom played a crucial role in the establishment uh, of the State of Israel. And it was at the end of the British mandatory period that the United Nations adopted a resolution, the partition resolution. The partition resolution envisioned the creation of two states, one Jewish, one Arab, and with special international status, if you will, for Jerusalem. That in and of itself, shall we say, isn't law, but when Israel then declared six months later, its declaration of independence, and then became a member of the United Nations. Israel acceded to the family of nations. And Israel has, although been discriminated against and held to a triple standard, Israel has standing at the UN and the ability to participate and the ability to chair committees, the ability to even sit in the, in the, the seat of the chair uh, as a vice chair of the General Assembly. Those things don't make law, but they are indicia. And people take a look at the indicia and seem to think that that is substantive international law. It's not, but it's the international relations of countries that have recognized Israel, that have given Israel the standing as a state in the family of nations. That same partition resolution, as I already said, envisioned the creation of an Arab state. And instead of proceeding immediately to the establishment of the independent state of Arab Palestine, back then pursuant to the resolution, there were launchings of wars. And then there was an agreement, a set of agreements, and one of which was the Oslo Accords. And whether anybody likes it or doesn't like it, that agreement became an agreement between parties and that has governed, therefore, and is intended to govern the various relations between the parties. 
So those various issues cannot be ignored when one looks at the total complexity of international law. And you can't just simply in, the, in a vacuum say, well, the General Assembly adopted a resolution uh, on settlements about Israel and that's international law because it's not. Back to you, Natasha. Richard, the questions are flooding in. I'm gonna take as many of them as possible in the final 10 minutes. Um, the, the first is with respect to the UN Committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people, uh, which the questioner writes is literally mandated to promote anti-Israel propaganda and facilitate anti-Israel NGO collaboration. How do you think we can best push back against this particular kind of UN propaganda? Uh, <clears throat> the United Nations uh, established and funded a number of divisions and committees that are packed with people who are on payroll, who have as their jobs that of displaying the deprived rights of the Palestinian people as portrayed by them at the UN and Israel as the perpetrator. Diplomacy will work to continue to change that. That's why I showed those two graphs showing closer and closer less yeses, uh, more abstentions, more non-participants. That's gonna continue to take a long period of time. But we have to take each, each little no vote as a major victory. And I can tell you one more thing. When we've taken these 100 amb UN ambassadors and we showed them everything that we could show them, including the wall, in Israel, they came back and they said the following, they've been lying to us at the United Nations and it will be reflected in changes in our votes over time. They now have to convince their presidents, prime ministers and foreign ministers. It's not an overnight process. Back to you, Natasha. And of course, um, the uh, most recent huge achievement in diplomatic terms, the Abraham Accords, um, no doubt presents uh, an incredible opportunity to change the paradigm that you described in, in the majority of your talk. Um, on relations with the Arab world, one questioner asks, should normalization be encouraged with states such as Saudi Arabia, uh, but not only, which have very dubious human rights record uh, records? What, what's your view on that, Richard? Absolutely. And the reason I say absolutely is that if human rights records were a measure, <laughs> Libya wouldn't sit on the Human Rights Council, Iran wouldn't sit on the Human Rights Council, Syria wouldn't sit on the Human Rights Council, uh, other countries that are oppressors wouldn't sit on the Human Rights Council, and they wouldn't be allowed to be in the United Nations. The UN was established to be a family of nations. And as it relates to Israel, I am seeing more and more behind the scenes ongoing work, including since the establishment of the new coalition government in Israel, where they are outreaching to more and more countries, building on the tremendous accomplishment of the Abraham Accords that brought countries both from the Arab League and other countries to the table, recognizing Israel, entering into diplomatic relations, signing tree, uh, 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 trade and other agreements. And I predict that as domestic politics in the United States and in Israel and in those countries permits, you will see more warming of relations with countries like Saudi Arabia, Oman, and many others that are poised. You're also seeing more and more countries slowly transitioning to Jerusalem, a very important matter, just as uh, the United States moved its embassy to Jerusalem. An important step, recognizing Israel's capital as its capital. And moving from uh, relations with the Arab world uh, and further afield, um, a question with respect to Israel's relations with the Jewish world. Uh, the question asks, well, says, thank you, Richard, uh, and asks, are you encouraged by the recent appointment uh, by Israel of a minister for the diaspora Jewry, plus a budget to start doing exactly what you are advocating. What do you think of the new government's approach on these issues? 
The answer is yes, I, I am encouraged. And yes, there are problems. I can tell you, having served as, as president of the American Zionist movement for these last four years, we, had, uh, we started out with 24 or so organizations. Four years later, when I left office, we had 39 organizations from across the spectrum, very far to the left, very far to the right, some of whom even come very close to, to supporting uh, different boycott principles. Uh, um, and it's difficult to keep Zionists together in a room. I think it's essential. It was Theodore Herzl in 1897 that bought a dis brought a disparate Jewish people together in Basel for the first Zionist Congress. And I think that the continued work that is needed to outreach to the Jewish communities around the world is an essential function of the Israeli government. Because the fact of the matter is, we all know when one Jewish person gets attacked, we all get attacked. When Israel gets attacked, we all get attacked. And I think that uh, Nachman Shai, who's just been appointed and just today outreached with a very important message of unity uh, is an important addition. But previous governments, uh, ne Prime Minister Netanyahu's government also did tremendous outreach. They also worked in strategic affairs, giving us all helpful, supportive tools to stand up, speak out and be counted. We've got a question here related to the litigation that you uh, described in your presentation, not to make this party political at all, uh, but the question asks whether the squad and other Democrats uh, were involved in resisting any of the litigation that you've described. So what have you seen between the legal and political interplay? I, I know you mentioned that some members of Congress had uh, written amici submissions. Um, these, those sounded supportive. Have you had any pushback from the political world? Only, only in public speak. I'm not aware of any member of Congress who has uh, filed a brief with the United States court uh, opposing uh, victims uh, uh, litigation. Of course, they do oppose legislation. And you referred to the squad, uh, the, 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 these members, fairly young members of Congress, new members of Congress have been given a very large voice and people are afraid to stand up against them. I'm not, my friends are not, and it's essential to stand up against the hate that they spew. When, when uh, uh, one member of Congress talks about the Holocaust giving her a calming feeling, it's beyond comprehension. And she has to be castigated. She was castigated, but not castigated by the Congress itself. The Congress is doing a terrible job at policing the hate and anti-Semitism that is coming from certain members of Congress. The court of public opinion turns on those issues. And we have to see to it that more and more people in the press stand up. Unfortunately, fewer are willing to do so. Richard, in the, in the last few minutes remaining, I just want to return to the wall opinion and the final question uh, that we've received on that. But before I do, just um, a, a word to the many, many questions that have been asked uh, about the wider issues of international law um, and settlement issues on the Ben and Jerry's boycott uh, and wider boycott issues and the approach in the US uh, to that uh, BDS movement uh, to say that there are a number of previous webinars that have gone into a lot of detail on those topics, which you'll be able to find on the UKLFI Charitable Trust uh, YouTube page. And I, I encourage our viewers uh, to, uh, to find the answers to those questions in those previous webinars. And to finally conclude, Richard, with respect to the ICJ wall opinion, um, there's a question that asks if there's any sign that that 2004 advisory opinion has been accepted as international law by UN states rather than dismissed as biased political propaganda. For example, uh, the ICJ opinion puts oblig uh, it states puts obligations on all nation states uh, calling for various economic sanctions to be put on Israel and Israeli businesses. Uh, and uh, the questioner writes, and pretty much all UN states have ignored um, those demands. Um, of course, there is an interplay uh, with other UN bodies, such as the UN Human Rights Council, the blacklist that has been produced uh, in anticipation of uh, boycotts against Israeli businesses. 
Um, but what would you say in answer to the question uh, about the wall opinion um, as to how it is now being perhaps applied by some individuals um, in the international legal arena uh, as law, as a, as a legal assessment uh, that they um, utilise? Certainly we've seen it uh, with respect to arguments in front of the International Criminal Court. Um, so what do you say about an advisory opinion being used as a as a legal tool uh, in this unprecedented fashion. It's a misuse of, of the opinion. It's a hijacking. Um, unfortunately, federal courts in the United States, courts in the UK, courts elsewhere, refer to the advisory opinion as if it were the force of, carried the force of law, and it doesn't. Um, in in the, uh, the Bloody Price of Freedom, we outline a number of these cases. And we also link it, by the way, to the boycott issue that you raised, Natasha, and I'll close with this. Because um, the United States government in 1979 adopted legislation that um, made the Arab boycott illegal and then created some penalties. And various countries were then cited year after year after year by the US Department of Commerce charged with enforcing uh, all steps against the Arab boycott. Um, interestingly, when the UAE and Bahrain signed the Abraham Accords, they were two of the worst perpetrators of the boycott against Israel as it relates to having been cited by the US Department of Congress and having been found guilty by the US Department of Congress or having entered into consent decrees that they won't do it anymore. We will see whether or not with the Abraham Accords, with Bahrain and the UAE having now signed trade agreements, if that boycott will dissipate. What's the lesson therefore, both about the wall and about boycotts, silence, doesn't work. The old concept of, excuse this expression, I hope I don't offend anybody, the Shah still mentality didn't work then and it's not working now. We have to point out every single violation, write the op-eds and where there's a basis, launch the litigation and where it's cross-border, uh, uh, litigation work together. And lastly, cross border, there are interparliamentary groups, UK parliamentarians and members of the US Congress, Canadian parliamentarians, members of the Knesset and other, other countries across the, the, the EU. They, the interparliamentary groups standing with Israel have the ability to get the eyes and the ears of the sitting president, prime minister, foreign minister, and leaders of the opposition to all stand up. Take a look at what has gone on in Poland. They adopted the Poland Holocaust speech law, which criminalized, criminalized demeaning of the Polish nation by analogizing it to being involved as collaborators in the Holocaust. With diplomacy, those criminal sanctions were wiped out, but the civil sanctions remain. And now there's new laws Poland is putting in on restitution. Those issues need all of us outside of our countries to work together to stand against those injustices and to do what we can to Tzedek uh, Tzedek Tirdo to seek justice and to do so in our time. Thank you very much, Natasha. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Jonathan. And thanks to all of you who've joined us today. Richard, thank you. I'm certain that none of our audience can remain silent uh, after your presentation. And you've certainly armed us all uh, with the background, the knowledge uh, and the enthusiasm uh, to pick up the mantle uh, and ensure that these misrepresentations and abuses don't go unanswered. Thank you for all of the work that you do and will continue to do. Uh, and take care until next time. Thank you.